All right, doing a quick recording here on um, obstetrics. So one of the first things to talk about is the stages of pregnancy, which I've covered earlier in another video, but I wanted to go over it really quickly, kind of mostly just to reveal what to do about these um, complications of these different stages. So, um, you know, you have a, a first stage, a second stage, and a third stage of lab labor. The first stage is when you're um, basically having contractions really close together, um, but it's divided up. It's divided up into um, um, two stages as well. And the first of these two stages is when the cervical os is dilated, um, or the cervix is dilated from to zero to about four centimeters. And the second uh, part of this first stage is when uh, the cervix is dilated from uh, four to ten centimeters. And then after ten centimeters, we bump into the second stage of labor. And the second stage of labor is uh, from the point of 10 centimeters dilated until the baby comes out. As soon as the baby comes out, we're in the third stage of labor, which is the delivery of the placenta. And these different stages take different amounts of time. So um, one of the biggest effects on it is going to be um, the whether or not the mother has had babies before. So everything usually goes a lot slower if the mother's had babies, babies before. Another thing that tends to slow things down is if she is given... Uh, mostly in the second stage, anyways. If she's given a, um, um, I can't think of the word, where they they numb everything down there with a, uh, with um, <laughs> I can't think of what it's called. Anyway, where you um, stick the needle in the back, releases fluids into the uh, uh, cerebral spinal fluid that basically puts a block and everything down low, so she doesn't feel the pain. Cannot think of the word for right now. Total uh, brain fart there. Uh, so anyway, so the they call it a latent first stage of pregnancy if if a first-time mom goes above 20 hours or if a second-plus-time mom goes over 14 hours. And if that happens, you can give some oxytocin. Oxytocin is something uh, normally that's released from the posterior um, pituitary that causes the uh, uterus to clamp down. You can also give an amniotomy, which is... Um, just another another option there. The um, now the latent phase was the first part of the first stage of pregnancy. So the active first stage of pregnancy is remember when it goes from four centimeters on up to ten centimeters. And so in this case, um, if it goes above two hours, uh, you start to worry. Um, and then there is the uh, second stage. Uh, or excuse me, if it goes above two hours, you start to worry that's considered um, something uh, not inactive. And you can do an amniotomy, oxytocin, or you may consider even a C-section if it goes too long. Then we have the second stage of pregnancy, which is um, one to three hours. Now, typically what it is, if it's above two hours for a first-time mom, then it would be considered um, taking too long, <laughs> a delayed second stage. Um, if it is above one hour in a second time mom, then you would consider it being delayed. Now, if the mother has been given uh, an epidural, that's the word I was looking for. If the mother's been given an epidural, um, then you just add on an hour as far as what's normal because it delays everything by about an hour. And in this, in this case, you can give oxytocin, you can do forceps, um, uh, vacuum, C-section, and um, oxytocin can be given at any point when contractions are less than three times in a 10 minute period uh, or if they have really poor intensity um, and poor intensity is like it's not giving enough pressure and the pressure described is less than 24 uh, mill millimeters of mercury so preterm uh, preterm premature rupture of membranes is when the, the membranes rupture before 37 weeks along because after 37 weeks it's considered full term before 37 weeks it's cons considered um, preterm. So um, uh, there's also something called a prolonged rupture of memories, which is, means 18 hours prior to delivery. So what about what do you do if there's rupture of membranes? Well, it kind of depends on how far along you are, but how do you know if you've even had the rupture of membranes? Well, there's, there's at least four different tests you can do. One's called the sterile speculum exam, which is where you look in there with a speculum. That's a little duckbill thing goes in there, opens it up, and you look inside and you see pooling of amniotic fluid in the vaginal fault, vault, vault. If you see that, very likely that the water's um, 
that the premature that the rupture membranes has occurred. The thing you can do is something called nitralazine paper test. So you know that the normal vaginal fluids have a certain pH, and that pH is very low. It's very very acidic in there, um, and so if it's uh, more alkaline in there then the nitri nitrilazine paper will turn blue and you'll think, okay, this person must have uh, rupture of the membranes. The other thing you can do is do a fern test. You get some of the little swab, you put it on a little um, piece of glass, you put the piece of glass under a microscope, you look at it, you see if it kind of ferns as it dries, almost like ice on a window. Then you think, okay, that must be, uh, must be the uh, amniotic fluid. And the last one is you can do this indigo carmine dye check for leakage as well. Okay, so what do you do if somebody has rupture of the membranes? Well, if it's over 37 weeks, uh, basically just check for group B strep and then, you know, either induce the labor to do it right now or you can wait 24 to 72 hours. Above that, uh, time to time to make this, make this baby come. Um, if it's less than um, 34 to 36 weeks, um, or I guess it's greater, so somewhere between 37 and 34, uh, you may consider inducing labor. Um, you have to see what to do. Um, if it's less than 32 weeks, the pelvic rest uh, and waiting is kind of what you have to do. But in the meantime, you give the person antibiotics like gentamicin, ampicillin, in case they have group B strep or some other infection. And you also want to give them corticosteroids. Why the corticosteroids? Because um, that goes into the baby and helps the baby's, baby's lungs mature. And that's kind of a concern when the baby's a little bit premature like that. So what about preterm labor? So preterm labor is any time the mother goes into labor, sometime between 20 to 37 weeks gestation. So this is the number one cause of neonatal death and um, morbidity. So uh, what do you do if it's looking like the mother's going into preterm labor? Bed rest. Also, you can give tocolytic therapy. That's stuff that slows down the contractions and everything. So beta mimetics, uh, magnesium, SO4, I think it's sulfate, I can't remember. Uh, calcium channel blockers, uh, prostaglandin eyes, um, steroids, penicillin, ampicillin for group B step prophylaxis. Uh, what about breach presentation? So there's three different types of breach presentation. There's butt first, where the lit baby's legs are, are not, they're not flexed, they're straight, so the, just the butt comes out. Um, then there's also footling breach, where the baby... Uh, the butt's coming out first, but one leg is sticking out, so actually the leg comes first. It could be one leg or it could be both legs come out first. But essentially, ba um, leg or butt first. And then there's the complete breach. With this is where basically the babe's, baby's feet and butt come out at the same time, so the baby's knees are flexed. Um, that's really bad. That's going to cause some serious tears. So what's the treatment? Well... 75% of the time, it just switches, right? Right before the baby comes out, things move around. So most of the time, you don't have to do anything if you feel and you see the baby's breech. Um, the baby will end up switching to vertex presentation, and it'll be fine by the time 38 weeks roll around. But another thing you can do is something called external uh, version, which is basically you take your hands on the mom's tummy, and you try to move the baby around to get the baby's head down. That only works like half the time. So the blood loss during pregnancy, um, it's really considered, you know, abnormally high if it's above 500 milliliters of blood for vaginal delivery, but it's pretty normal um, up to 1,000 milliliters of blood for C-section. So C-sections bleed more. Uh, some postpartum hemorrhage risks are uterine atony, genital tract trauma, genital tract trauma, and retained placental tissue. So basically, sometimes the mom is going to bleed a lot. Uh, hemorrhage during giving birth. And so this uterine atony can be caused by a couple of things. If the, if the uterus has been so stretched out by a huge baby or multiple babies in there or maybe polyhydramnios where there's like too much fluid in there, super stretched out, it's really hard for it to get enough power and energy and everything to clamp down as small as it needs to get. So sometimes if it's too big like this and it can't clamp down, those blood vessels can't clamp, clamp down and the bleeding won't stop. So that's one problem. Sometimes also, if you try to make the, everything happen too fast, too quickly, and you give too much oxytocin, too much stimulation, the, this myometrium can just get really tired, and then it gets atonic, and it can't clamp down enough, and the mom's just going to keep bleeding because these blood vessels don't get clamped down. And then also, there can be other uh, things, like if there's uh, myoma in there, or you've given uh, too much um, drugs to the mom to make the pain go away. Um, 
So those are all things that can cause it. Next is postpartum infection. So if the mother has a temperature greater than 37 degrees for at least two of the 10 days after, but not the first 24 hours, I don't know why they don't count the first 24 hours. Uh, maybe all the trauma and exercise makes the temperature raise. Um, so two to 10 days afterwards, um, above 37 degrees Celsius, that's a bad thing. I mean, she's got a, he's got a uh, fever, post-term infection most likely. So what do you do about uh, C-sections? You know, I probably ought to throw this in here. What are the seven W's of postpartum fever uh, 10 days after delivery? Uh, they've got the seven W's of the womb, which is endomyometritis, wind, adelectasis, pneumonia, water, urinary tract infection, walk, I don't know how this relates to it, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, wound, incision, or episiotomy, uh, weaning, breast engorgement, abscess, mastitis, or wonder drugs, uh, drug fever. And lastly, here we have the cesarean section, when do you do it? Um, sometimes, these are all thin plate times you can do it, power C-section, genital herpes infections, uh, cervical carcinoma, HIV infection, cephalopelvic disproportion, which means basically the baby's not going to fit through the canal, uh, placenta previa, failed operative vaginal uh, delivery, fetal malposition, it means like maybe the baby's like sideways or something, fetal distress, cord compression, prolapse, erythroblastosis fatalis, and that's from the RH factor. I hope that lecture was helpful.